to get in the way, to get in the way as well. Question 69. Why are we single or married to respect the fact that God established marriage and created us male and female? Well, marriage is to be respected by all so that individuals may flourish in modesty and self-control. Whether you're married or not married, we still respect the gift of marriage. Now, the majority of people get married in life. They do. The majority of them get married. Some don't, and that's okay. But it all applies to all of us, that we live in the context of marriage that God established for us. If, if we are married, then we live in that wonderful, intimate relationship with our spouse. If we do not get married, we respect that God has done that, and we don't participate in that other relationships that husbands and wives do. That we see that, and we thank God for the wonderful gift that he's given to us. God has given that so that husbands and wives may flourish. What have we found out? Uh, uh, studies have been shown that people who are married um, live longer. And especially who have longer marriages. They live longer. They, that, they just, that scientifically they have proven that. So that they become dependent, or as they say, interdependent upon each other. That they, they uh, rely on each other as these ezers, that these zakars and nekbas, that they live in the relationship that God uh, has established, and they do flourish. They live longer. Uh, there's a whole bunch of this stuff. They, they make more money in life. I mean, they save better. The whole, their just lifestyle is just so much better as well. Um, letter C, family, society, creation as a whole flourish through the procreation and raising of children. Um, God established that children to be nurtured in the homes. God says that's where that's supposed to be. And husband and wife, mother and father, they are to take care of that. They are to do that so that those children can grow up. Now, remember, your children's example or model of a marriage is yours. It is amazing that uh, as children grow up, they want to marry someone like mom or dad. Even though they're teenagers, they want nothing to do with it. In the back of their mind, I want to marry someone like mom or dad. We are the example. So how do we treat one another? How do we do that? How do we model that to one another as well? That is so important. Um, and one of the big things that we need to model before our children is this wonderful word. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now I know I've seen this other places, but in Devin I's bedroom there is a plaque that's on it that says, uh, how's it go? The marriage of good marriage is made up of two, two good, good forgivers. forgivers. Two good forgivers. Always quick to forgive. Not so quick to point fingers. Always quick to forgive. Let me tell you, life goes so much better when you live in the forgiveness of sins. When you live in the forgiveness of sins. Because we forgive because Christ has forgiven us. And so, a constant reminder, that's what God uh, wants us to be doing as well. Now, uh, obviously, one of the results of being married, of husband and wife, we even say that in the marriage vows, is the procreation of children and their nurturing and having, growing them up in the faith. Um, that's the way God, that's God even told Adam Eve, I want you to multiply, I want you to fill the earth, and that still happens today, and how God blesses us through that, um, that the next generation comes uh, through that. So that's where God wanted that as well. Question number 70, question number 70. What does our created nature or natural law teach us about marriage? So to outside of the Bible, there's what we think called natural law. Um, it kind of applies to all people for all time. Uh, and it says here, human beings are by nature male or female. There's only two, male or female. Either you're one or the other. According to the pattern of nature itself, a new human life cannot be conceived without a man or a woman. The most natural setting for the care of a baby is born for the child to be cared for by his and, or her mother and father who have com committed themselves to each other and to their child. The natural pattern has been the basis for marriage and families throughout all human history and every human culture. So 
So it's always important that um, moms and dads, husbands and wives, would be there to raise their children. Natural law says that. Natural, that's apart from the Bible. Natural law tells us that's the way it should be. What does the Bible affirm about people who are not married? Well, our identity, birth, completeness as human being is not determined by our marital status, but by our creator and redeemer. Our, 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 you know, how we look at ourselves, our value is what God has told us. We are holy unto him. He has made us his very own. Um, you can be very happy and not be married. You can be married and very happy as well. That's the station that God puts us in. A, God's made us stewards of his creation, whether single or married. We're everywhere. At one time, in every person's life in this room, you were single. How many people were single in their, in their life at one time? You should all be raising your hand. Well, yeah, one time, we're all single one time. God blessed us then, and then we, some of us got married. And that's happy too. And God blesses us through that as well. God has given all good things to all Christians, whether single or married. So it's not the married or not married that God blesses. God blesses all people. And, and the station or the vocation or your calling in life, whether it's may, may, married or not married. And so that's the way God established that. God calls unmarried persons to live in contentment as they trust in Him and serve their neighbor. So there are times when some people may never get married. God still blesses them. He still uses them. And He wants to use them as well. People will not be married in the age to come after Jesus returns. And that's that's an important thing. Uh, that's going to be the gospel lesson for next Sunday, uh, where Jesus has asked, In heaven, will we be married to one another? And Jesus says, No, that relationship's going to be, that relationship will cease. There will be no need for procreation and nurturing in heaven because we're all there. You know, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will nurture us in the faith uh, in there. So uh, after we die, we, we won't be married again in heaven. So that'll be all right. What is the Christian view of living together apart from marriage, cohabitation? Um, I can, can I just sum this up for you? Don't do it. Just write that down. Don't, you don't live together as husband and wife before you're married. Now, I would have couples come in, and they're living together, and I would tell them, one, do not sit in my confirmation class. Did you not hear what I said? Yes, Pastor. Did you think it not applied to you? And then usually it's the guy who says, well, Pastor, I always test drive a car before I buy it. I said, do you test drive underwear before you buy it? <laughs> no. But I would think underwear would be a little more intimate than a car. Oh, and the other thing is, are you equating your future wife to a car? Where do you keep the car? In the garage? Do you need to keep your wife in the garage? Really? Really? Of course, they start thinking, oh. And I said, the other thing is, it's not always wise to be sleeping around with people before you're married. And I said to the guy, did you know your future wife is had slept around with someone before she got married. He goes, who? Who Who did it? I'm going, thou art the man. You did it. Let me tell you, couples, older couples that come in and innocently they say, oh, we've had sex before we were married. That weighs heavy on them. Don't do that. If you're doing it, stop. Does God forgive? Yes, he does. He always does. It's always best to wait before you're married to do that. Now, if anybody comes to me and have premarital counseling, and you come and say, we're living together before you're married, we're married, what do you think I'm going to say to you? Yeah, yeah did you not read that in confirmation class? <laughs> you don't listen to me? <laughs> because this is so important. God says this is not good. I mean, there's a whole list there. There's a whole list there. That, and it, can, it just confuses people as well. Because then marriage itself becomes secondary or third, or fourth on the list. The day they get married, well, it's not as special as it, it was if they waited. Just wait. Wait until 
that night. And then you realize the wonderful gift that God has given to you. And so that, I tell you to do that. Um, what, uh, question 73, what should husbands and wives do when they struggle in marriage? Um, we live in a sinful world, most definitely. Divorce happens. It does happen. Uh, there are times when that happens. And, and the one thing that we have to remember is that if you're struggling, there are people there to help you. Um, it's not the end. Um, don't lose hope, you know, and, and people can help you that. Pastors will meet with you. We have counselors that we can do that. Like I said before, this is huge, living in the forgiveness of sins. Living in the forgiveness of sins um, and, and uh, dealing with all that. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Beginning at verse 21. Actually, yes. Beginning at verse 21. So Ephesians 5, verse 21. So if you ever wonder, what does God have to say about marriage? Paul says it right here. Y'all there yet? Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 21. Paul says, Submit, or here my translation, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does it mean to submit? Submit. What does this mean? So, what are the words we use sub with? Subway. Submarine, suburban, kind of underneath. Submit. I want you to think submit is putting yourself under to help. I think submitting the equivalent of the Old Testament is Ezra. He needs someone who helps. So he, Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence, out of faith, out of respect for Christ. So we are submitting, we are supporting, we are helping one another out of our faith in Christ. And then Paul goes on. Why submit to your own husbands as to the Lord? For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, uh, I, I do premarital, and so I'm reading this to the, to the couple. So I, I stop there and I say, okay, just think about that. And I, then I continue on and I say, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the words, so he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives uh, with their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So, therefore, a man should leave his father and mother, will fast to his wife, the two should become one flesh. This mystery is profound. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And then I stop, and I look at the couple, and I say, who's got the harder job, the husband or the wife? Why the husband? Because he's got something important to do that he needs to do. Yes, exactly, which is what? Say yes, dear. <laughs> I could have you could just start with that we could have left and have <laughs> the husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church what how did Jesus love the church he gave his life, his life. he gave his life he gave up the glories of heaven and everything there to come down here this sin infected dirty grungy world and he died on the cross for us dirty rotten sinners so that we could be with him forever that's the love that god wants husbands to have for their wives the self-sacrificing willing to give up everything for the wife so husbands love 
They're mine. And then, what am I supposed to do? Go into the last verse I read. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. What is the wife to be doing to the husband? Respecting him. You can say submit, but I think this is a better word. Respect. What would be, what would be another word for respect? Honor. That would be, yeah. Things like that. Now, Paul gives us a little secret about the marriage relationship. He says, husbands, when you love your wife, she will respect you. And wives, when you respect your husband, they will love you. The love the way Christ would want us to love our wives. That we respect our husbands. There's this cycle that's going on. God made males and females different. Huh, I just told you something profound. Not really. What do women, what do they crave the most? Love. What do males crave the most? Safe chocolate. Chocolate? <laughs> okay, that's Valentine's Day. The 364 other days of the year. Love. What do, men, what do males crave? What do they want more than anything? Be respected. God made us that way. That a, ma a male feels his worth when he's respected. A female feels her worth when she's being loved. So when husbands love their wives, their wives will respect, and there's this cycle that goes on. This even goes with our sons and daughters. You know, when, when a father loves his daughter, she will respect her father. When, when the, uh, the wife respects the son, the son will love the mom. That this just, it's just amazing how this works. But it ultimately, this relationship between husband and wife is really an example of whose relationship? Well, if it says, oh, the picture of husband and wife is really the picture of what? Christ, Christ and his love for us in the church. What does Christ do for us? He sacrificed everything for us. And he wants us to love him back, respect him back. And so there's this cycle that goes on. The problem is sin comes in the world and the bus, the wheels come off the bus. But this is where this happens again. We forgive. There's forgiveness, and we get back on. And this happens. When this happens, this is wonderful. This is great. When, when life sings up like this, this is wonderful. And that's the way God wants it to be, and to uh, continue down that path as well. Um, so what does God, the Bible say about divorce and remarriage? Well, God doesn't want divorce, but it happens. Can people who have been divorced, can they remarry? They can. They can. And hopefully, the second time around, they figure it out. They figure it out for whatever reason. Now, I don't always agree with the Roman Catholic Church, well, hardly on anything, but this one I agree on, that if a couple comes in who have been divorced and they want to get remarried, they go through the whole process of what happened to cause the divorce in their first marriage. So they figure out, make sure that they don't do that again. I think that's... Found. In fact, I do that when couples come in and they're, they're wanting to get remarried again. I say, okay, let's find out that we don't do the same thing again. Studies have shown that people who get married and divorce, they get married again, the rate of uh, divorce goes up. And every time they get divorced and remarried again, it just almost to the point where I don't even know what the number is. By the time you get to that number, it's 100% guarantee that you're going to get a divorce. So we want to make sure that we eliminate that, that we take care of that. We all, they're sinful human beings. We all fall into sin. People divorce, but there's also forgiveness. And there are people who get married a second time, and it's wonderful. It's fantastic. And, and God blesses that. So we do have that. Uh, so, uh, so initially, be very picky who you marry. In other words, keep your eyes wide open when you get married. And after you're married... Keep them half closed and live in this. Because there's no one perfect. No one perfect. And 
as well. 75, what are some of the dangers and temptations that pornography poses? As I said, um, that it treats people as objects. It's fake sex. Uh, you can put it that way. It, 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 it uh, 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 diminishes and uh, 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 sexual, you know, the, the intimacy. Um, it, it, there's fantasy in there. Um, it, it just corrupts the whole thing. So uh, stay away from that. Kind of the whole, you know, uh, see them as objects and, and it's that. Um, and, and as it says here in letter C, it makes unrealistic views and expectations. So um, you got to stay away with that. What does God? What does the Bible say about same-sex marriage? Well, God says it was male and female. That that's what marriage is all about. We live in a culture. We live in a society that has accepted same-sex marriage. Um, as a culture, <coughs> we as God's people say, no, no, no. God says male and female, and and so we must stand up for that uh, as well. Uh, what is the Christian uh, perspective of persons who are confused about their sexual identity? Now, what I find interesting is that this question would have never shown up in the catechism before 2015. But now, now we have it. Now we have to talk about that. What about those times? And we see that it seems to be prevalent more and more and more. Um, obviously, we need to talk about that. Realizing the gift that God has given to you, whether you're a male or a female, that's what God did. He doesn't make mistakes. Uh, there are other people you can talk to, counselors, your pastors, um, and, and things like that, that, that we, can, we, we can work through those issues um, and things like that. So uh, remember, and I always tell people, um, whether they believe they think they're homosexual or gender identity crisis, don't believe the lie. Satan tells you a lie. Don't believe it. God tells you the truth, and he wants you to trust that. Yes, will some people struggle with that more than others? Most definitely. But other people struggle with other sins more than that, uh, those sins. So it's always there. Temptation is always going to come. But God says, trust in me, I will help you through that. I will help you through that. And so, um, in, in dealing with that as well. All right? Any questions on that? I mentioned this before, just my five final note in my catechism. Many of you will be married one day. Pray that the Lord will prepare your future spouse for you as the Lord prepares for you for your future spouse. Save yourself for that person. The greatest gift you can give on your wedding night to your future spouse is yourself. Or as they would say, your virginity. That you give that to that person as well. All right, quest, uh, seventh cat, uh, oh, we'll get that next week, I'm not worried about Seventh commandment. All right, any questions on that? Have a great day, we'll see you next week. Yeah, in that room where we're in.